Thanks for listening to this podcast from Walks Around Britain. For more information, our terms of use, and to click through to see the show notes on our blog with photographs, videos, and links to related sites, please visit walksaroundbritain.co.uk. seventh edition of the Walks Around Britain podcast, we go for a walk with Winnie the Pooh through Ashdown Forest. We look at events taking place during National Parks Week. We take a flight for a different view of the Dark Peaks iconic reservoirs and... It's called Walks in the Country Near London, which is not exactly the most inventive title you can but, it, but it, it's a Ron Seal job. Ding ding! Walking writer Christopher Somerville tells us about his latest book and his passion for walking. Hello and welcome to the Walks Round Britain podcast. The 2012 London Olympics are in full swing and it was great to see Great Britain's green and pleasant land featuring in the opening ceremony. The team here were all very impressed with it, but we did slightly take exception to the notion that the Industrial Revolution got rid of our countryside. Whilst it's true it did sweep away whole areas and create pollution, the Industrial Revolution also gave us the canals, the roads and the railways which now enable us to go and see more of our beautiful countryside. And indeed, many of the mills, bridges, viaducts, towns, cities and canals the age gave us are now excellent places to go and walk around. First, let's go off for a walk. In the sixth edition of the podcast, writer and blogger Tanya Oliver told us about the wonderful county of Sussex and explained her passion for the area. On this month's podcast, she's taking a walk through Winnie the Pooh country, Ashdown Forest, and we're coming along too. So I've just arrived at the car park at Gill's Lap in Ashdown Forest. Um, it's early in the morning, very early in the morning. And beautiful day, absolutely. And I talk a lot about how beautiful Sussex is, but you only have to be here on a day like this, in a place like this. And you can see for miles. And I love this county. And My walk today is going to take me on one of my favourite routes and it's following in the footsteps of Winnie the Pooh. Ashdown Forest is about six and a half thousand acres of ancient heathland and woodland and you can do a whole range of walks, short walks, long walks or anywhere in between. The route today is only about two to two and a half miles but it takes in some really interesting sites which is why it's one of my favourites and you get to see a whole lot of different textures of this area. So as you head out of the car park, you're very quickly amongst the heathland and it feels a very different place. The first stop on this walk is the Enchanted Place and Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh decided it was the Enchanted Place because they couldn't count whether there were 63 or 64 trees in the area. It's it's basically a group of, of beautiful tall trees. But also, and more importantly if you want to sit down, that there were no prickly bits so it made a much more comfortable place to sit and you can't really argue with a statement like that. Ashdown Forest has got such a rich heritage and you can see the old manor houses. I mean it was a hunting ground from Norman times and it's nice to kind of picture what it would have been like here all those years ago and the sun is shining, it's warm even though it's early in the morning and the sky is blue so I feel like a very very lucky walker today. So as you move away from the enchanted place and continue the walk within a few minutes you're amongst all the beautiful gorse and the pine trees and actually you could be in the middle of nowhere yet it's only a few minutes from civilization I really love that about Ashdown Forest and as I walk off the main path on a smaller route I'm heading towards the heffalump trap now not all walks can boast a heffalump trap but this one can and it's beneath the lone pine and it's where piglet tried to capture the heffalump now I'm just making my way into the heffalump trap, no comments please, and it's very hard to imagine, I know it's a story, but it's very hard to imagine someone as small as Piglet digging out a hole this size to capture the heffalump. And actually there's a debate about whether this is where the trap is or whether it was somewhere else, but it seems as good a place as any. Now, 
What's really amazing is to think about how this place inspired such wonderful stories by A.A. A. Milne and the illustrations by E.H. Shepherd. And although Ashdown Forest is really extensive, this part here feels quite intimate and mystical. And it's not until you actually look out over the gorse hedges where you can see for miles that you really get that feeling for how big Ashdown Forest is because right here it feels very friendly and, and intimate. So you can kind of see why Piglet would have chosen this spot. I'm just leaving the heffalump trap now, and there's a sentence I never thought I'd say. And um, There's a very strange narrow gully down a slope which gets onto a lower level path, and there's quite a lot of prickly gorse to dodge here, which I'm trying to do now very carefully. Um, certainly this isn't the enchanted place with no prickly places. But what's odd about this gully is it's worthy of a much more wild and rugged place and you wouldn't think somewhere like this existed in Ashdown Forest but it really does have something for everyone but I'm just actually going to concentrate on making my way cautiously down here uh, hopefully without too much adventure and I've made it down safely and the whole walk changes here because now I'm on a really wide green open grassy path with views all around and what I remember about this walk is the last time I did it, I was looking after a friend's dog called Tilly, and she absolutely loved it here. It's a great place to walk dogs, and you see lots of people doing that here this morning. And this path now leads towards the memorial area for Milne and Shepherd, and I'm just going to make my way up to that now. And in the memorial area, there's a plaque, and at the end, it's got a really lovely sentiment. It says, they collaborated in the creation of Winnie the Pooh, and so captured the magic of Ashdown Forest and gave it to the world. I think that's a truly lovely sentiment, and it really captures for me that this really is a place that you can't help falling in love with because it's inspired such imagination. And you only have to look as you're walking around at the different textures, the different shades of green, the colours, even the birds singing all around me, which I hope you can hear. It really makes you feel inspired as well. I've always been a Winnie the Pooh fan. I mean, he really is my leadership guru. He makes a lot more sense than many people. But even if you're not, it's a great place to do a walk anyway. And like I said before, Ashland Forest is so extensive that you can pick your own route. You can make your way between the paths and amongst the forest and the heathland. Or you can do a, a planned route. There are lots of, lots of routes you can do um, which are highlighted at the visitor centre or online. And, you know, just, just pick a route and, and go and see for yourself what I mean. You really do have to see it to believe it. The Winnie the Pooh route I'm doing today just happens to be one of my favourites. The next part of the route takes you past Rue's Sandy Pit, which is a little quarry, effectively, and there's some water at the bottom and various shrubs and vegetation, but it doesn't actually look very sandy anymore, but worth a look nonetheless. And then you go across a little road and to the other side of the forest and it really changes again here and whilst all the sites have been quite close together until now here it really opens up and you're hit with this wide view across the heathland and towards a hundred acre wood which we'll come on to in a minute but the first thing you notice is that you start to walk amongst the really tall trees unlike the heathland before and I chose wellies today actually because despite it being a beautiful day there's been some rain in the last few weeks and I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but it's actually been fine. It hasn't been muddy at all. But nonetheless, I have fabulous pink wellies, so it's a very good excuse to use them. And as you emerge from the tall trees and you start to look out again over the heathland, what strikes me every time I do this walk is that whilst the expanse of heathland is so wide, there are just the occasional solitary or in groups of two or three trees, very tall trees, just in the, in the middle of the heathland. And that's quite strange. I haven't seen that anywhere before, and it's really quite special. And as you follow the slope down towards the stream, which I'm doing now, you come to a bridge, and there's a very interesting story about this part of the walk, and that's that Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh set out from the enchanted place one day, determined to discover the North Pole. And this is where they found it. Now, it may come as a surprise to some that it was actually Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh that found the North Pole, or indeed that it's in Sussex. But there you go. Having crossed the stream, which I'm actually quite surprised there isn't more water in it, given there's been quite a lot of rain recently, even though it's a beautiful day 
today, but it's a lovely sight nonetheless. But now I'm heading up a grassy path towards 100 Acre Wood, which is called 500 Acre Wood on the maps. And although it's a gentle gradient, nonetheless, please excuse my rather more laboured breathing. And although there's a whole lot of trees in 100 Acre Wood, a whole different variety, what you can see predominantly from the side I am are the pine trees. But I'm pleased to say that once you get to the top of the slope, my route heads on a more level path and actually heads away from 100 Acre Wood. And you can see back across the route that I've done today. And this more flat path I'm on now is at a much higher level. And it, there really are some wonderful views. And if you come to Ashdown Forest, I would seriously recommend that you go to the visitor centre because it really captures the history of Ashdown Forest because it's not just Winnie the Pooh it's famous for. There was Radio Aspidistra in World War II and many, many, many years before that it was famous for uh, the iron industry. And the Yastadam Forest Visitor Centre captures all of that, but also captures what the different types of trees, different animals, etc. are much more effectively than I ever could. But you can also pick up leaflets there for the different walks that you can do. I really like exploring the history of places when I walk there. And even if I've, it's somewhere I've done before, I kind of always learn something new. One of the things I love about this area is the little village of Hartfield, which has great cafes and pubs and an excellent Winnie the Pooh shop. But as well as that, uh, heart in Old English means deer. So Hartfield is filled with the deer. And Ashdown Forest is famous for having deer. And like I said earlier on, it used to be, a, a, from Norman times, a hunting ground. Now, I've never actually seen deer there, but they do run around wild and free. And I know several people that have seen them, so I live in hope that I will one day. As I follow this high-level path through the forest though, or through the heathland. I can see all the gorse around me now, back in gorse territory. And you can see the whole vibrant yellow colours, and actually there are still some bluebells around, but the gorse is much better and much more beautiful in the autumn. It really then is at, at its full bloom, and it's a really beautiful contrast between the greens and the yellow gorse, so that's totally worth a visit. I've just stopped, not entirely because I need a breather because actually I've been on quite a flat path for a while but to make sure I'm soaking up the views and the atmosphere because I can sometimes be very guilty of being very purposeful on my mission and forgetting to appreciate where I am and I can see all the way back over the walk I've done including the enchanted place and hundred acre wood down into Eeyore's gloomy place and I know I've said it before but the views are so extensive and you really do have to see it to believe it it's just beautiful you can see for miles and miles and I've just passed a couple with a dog, and they're the first people I've seen today. And people say the South East is overcrowded, and no doubt they're right in parts. But in Sussex you can find beautiful solitude. If, if you want to walk in solitude, you can do that. Or if you want to be with other people, there are walks to do that as well. But even if you're on your own and you see the old person exchanging cheery hellos, it's just wonderful. Now I'm just getting back towards the car park now. So that's my walk done now, pretty much. I've been very lucky having such beautiful weather and it's been a great walk so I really hope you come and try that. And you can find out more about walking in Sussex and links to Tanya's blog on the show notes to this edition of the podcast on our blog. And you can reach that by clicking through from the homepage of our website at walksroundbritain.co.uk. <laughs> This year's National Parks Week in Great Britain is between the 30th of July and the 5th of August. So if you're listening to this podcast as soon as it's made, we're right in the middle of what is an event and activity packed week. All of the 15 national parks have a distinct and different character, from the water that is so evident in the Lake District National Park, to the mountains and the snow of the Cairngorms. One national park, which has even more reason to celebrate this year, is the North York's Moors who are celebrating their 60th anniversary this year. The park has a range of events during National Parks Week, including many for children. And Heather McNith from the National Park went to one event earlier this year, which is happening again on Sunday the 5th of August. Here in the National Park, we have lots of exciting events going on in National Park Week. 
including National Park Animal Olympics Games on Sunday the 5th of August at the Moors National Park Centre at Danby. Today we have some local schools trying out the Animal Olympic Games, so let's just see what it entails. Get a massive bit! Get the big bit! Keep it, put it back, I'll put it. Right, if we all move forward in the back, move back. In this activity, the children have been pretending to be crabs. They've all been linked together and they have a litter picker and they're walking across the sand trying to pick up all the litter and put it into a bin. You need to talk to each other, communicate. Uh, back to the bucket! That's right, well said. Tell me what you've been doing, please. Well, all of the USA children have all been linking together with arms, like the people next to you and the people behind you. And some people have had, like, been a litter picker and tried to pe uh, pick up little pieces of paper that's surrounded by the floor. Yeah. And it was very, very hard. So were you pretending to be like a crab, all linked together and walking sideways? Like yeah, like all of them litter pickers are like the crab's arms. Yeah. Well done, thank you very much. On the third. Can anybody see what it is? It's to do with the bottom part of it. OK. We've been um, like learning about the different birds and we got given out... Um, cards with birds on and we had to make uh, the noise of that bird and find the teams and then in our teams we had to go and um, find the right cool eggs and bring them back. And which bird were you? Um, uh, I was a lapwing and our noise was pewit. If you would like to take part in a National Park Animal Olympic Games and other great activities for families and children, pick up an out and about guide in one of our visitor centres or ring 01439 772 738 or go to northyorkmoors.org.uk And there's links to the National Park Portal website on the show notes to this edition of the podcast on our blog. Now us walkers often see the landscape from above when we hike up some of the country's highest points be it Arthur's Seat in Edinburgh Christ Hall Common in Essex or Brown Willie in Cornwall. But what about seeing the countryside from above in a completely different way? Well now there are many companies who offer pleasure flights at weekends in helicopters over some of the country's most scenic and iconic areas. And recently I met the friendly team of Central Helicopters of Nottingham in a field across from a pub for a flight over the three most famous reservoirs of the Peak District. It's mid-morning and the helicopter is already here with the ground crew checking her out and making sure that she's ready for flight. Today the team at Central Helicopters are running pleasure flights from here at Ola Bar, just outside Sheffield, and the passengers for today's trips are gathering now to be checked in. The trips today take off from here and travel all the way across the moors of the Dark Peak to the reservoirs of Lady Bower, Derwent and Howden, which together provide practically all of Derbyshire's water, as well as to a large part of South Yorkshire. Now the reservoirs aren't really famous for keeping Derbyshire residents in H2O, but really for being the training ground for Operation Chastise, otherwise known as the Dambuster Raids in the Second World War. Now this is going to be my first ever flight in a helicopter, and if I'm a machine to look too, it's probably not the experience everybody flying today will be undertaking, as I've got the door next to me removed so I can do some filming and some aerial shots of the reservoirs. So for the first time in a helicopter, and the door was off, but the great team of Central Helicopters will ensure that I'll be strapped in safely and that my precious camera too isn't going to be undertaking its own bouncing bomb impression. So, here it goes. <laughs> that was, that was amazing. From the air you really get a greater sense of how big those reservoirs are. 
The team at Central Helicopters market this trip as a Dan Busters tour, but it's a joy for us walkers to see places that we've known and walked around for years in a completely different light. My pilot today, David Marsland, tells us more about the tour. We take off from here out the bar, we fly straight up to the dams, we go up the Lady Bow, which is the first of the reservoirs, we fly up, it sort of forks off, there's left and right fork, and we follow the right fork and go up towards the Derwent, which has got those famous dam walls um, that they practiced on. And we fly up the Derwent up to the Howden at the top and kind of turn back around and then fly back, the kind of route they would have done, but admittedly considerably higher than they would have done it um, and just showing out the sights and then we get back over Lady Bower and then uh, carry on down the valley and uh, take a look at Chatsworth House and a few of the other little points along the way and then it's back to Isle Bar. So it's a really good, a really nice compact but, but really expressive tour isn't it? Yeah I mean there's absolutely loads going on, of all the tours we do there's, there's a lot of scenery, there's a load of things to see and um, it's normally got a lot of interest for everyone. And it's very interesting to see all the, the, the reservoirs because you, you, as you're walking around them, you, you do sort of think that they're very, very big and take up a lot of area. But when you see them from the sky, they're massive, aren't they? They are huge, yeah. I don't think a lot of people are always amazed at just how big they are. And obviously, a lot of people have walked around them. And f that's really... Um, we do get a lot of people who come from a dam bus experience and, and they're sort of the older generation who know a lot about the war but I would say the majority of people are the people who walk around the same they want to see the walks from, from above if you like and it always surprises them just how massive those reservoirs are and then when you swing around and you see Chatsworth in all its glory you really appreciate how beautiful and how well designed those grounds are yeah there. yeah it is it's a fantastic house it has to be said from the air you really appreciate the size of it just how nice it is so tell me about this helicopter this is a what's called a bell 206 it's a long ranger version there's a bell 206 with just five seats then the long ranger that we fly in with two extra seats so effectively seven including the pilot and it's a turbine helicopter um, and it really is sort of what people expect of a helicopter when it turns up. It kind of has a wow factor, I guess. And it's not just the Peaky Street that you fly all around, is it? No, no, this is just one of the places. Um, we fly from Nottingham, obviously, because that's where we're based at Nottingham Tolerton. Um, we fly from York, from an airfield in, in, in the York area. We do Emmerdale tours around that area. Um, and then we go up as far as Preston and um, the Lake District. We do Blackpool Tower tours and Lake Windermere tours and that kind of thing. So we kind of spread ourselves around the country, really. And you can see some of the stills from the filming I did on the flight on the show notes to this edition of the podcast on our blog. And you can see that by going to our website at walksaroundbritain.co.uk. Many thanks to the team at Central Helicopters for that flight. And there's a link to their website with all their tours across the Midlands and the north of England on the show notes too. Christopher Somerville is one of Britain's most prolific walking writers. He's the walking correspondent for The Times, writing a weekly walk for the newspaper entitled A Good Walk. He has also written over 40 books about walking in Britain, Ireland and other countries. In August, he adds to the tally with the release of a book featuring walks which are within an hour's train ride from London. And I'm delighted to say Christopher joins me on the podcast via Skype. Hello, Christopher. Hello, Andrew. Now, it has taken quite a while for us to collide together, <laughs> hasn't it, to talk to you. So I'm glad, I'm glad we finally managed it. So where have you been walking recently? Oh, well, recently, for example, I was up in, uh, in the north. I walked to Holy Island from the shore. Yes. Up in North Northumberland. That is a beautiful crossing of a wide tidal causeway where you climb up into little barnacle encrusted refuges along the way if the tide happens to catch you and you can see the, the, the castle on the crag and the ruined monastery remains out on the island as you go towards them with the big north sea sky behind them so that's a very beautiful walk then into the um, Northumbrian foothills at Elsdon for a circuit of that lovely village to the Durham hay fields and then to North Yorkshire for a, a round of Swaledale and Arkengarthdale very rainy day, which was all a question of putting your head down and getting the miles and really enjoying those misty views. Yes. And finally, a climb of Rosebury Topping for a fantastic view over industrial middles burn out to the sea and so on. That's a little snapshot of a trip of six or seven days, which uh, my wife and myself um, with a walk every day, no matter what the weather, and trying to try to catch the season. <laughs> um, 
make it extremely seasonal. How long have you been a walker? As a person who's gone walking in the countryside, I suppose about 45 years, something like that, 48 years. As a person who's enjoyed walking, because I didn't particularly enjoy it as a teenager, um, I suppose 40 years, something like that, and a person who's been making their living out of it, 30 years perhaps. It's a very interesting way to make a living, isn't it? I think so. I think I'm, a, I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world, really, um, because um, I can get exercise and... That's not just for the body, but for the mind as well, and get paid for it. And I know that everybody who, who says, you know, what do you do for anything exactly? You, you walk, and then they pay you for it. God, you lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, people go green. And, and obviously, there's a lot of hard work to it. And obviously, you know, it's, it's not just a question of skipping through the meadows saying, hello, sky, hello, flowers. But it is a fantastically lucky thing to be able to do. Because you're out here, particularly in the UK, you know, which is most of my field of operations nowadays. As people always say, you know, now you've done you know, 30 years of walking, haven't you walked everywhere? And the answer is, yes, I've walked that valley. But if, I, if I'd gone the next valley over, that's a place where I never have walked. So, you know, you, you, you can never um, run out of walks or, or, or sort of disengage the gear which says I'm very interested in doing more. But there's so many places in the UK to walk, and, and the variety is, is fantastic too. I haven't been all over the world, but I would say that for our size, a relative size, we're probably the most interesting and varied country in the world, for, for, particularly for walking, because we have this absolutely unique selection of footpaths, which are now, I mean, a lot of them are kept, in, kept open, as you know, by the, by the volunteer members of the Ramblers Association and by other people who just go out with their secretaires, snip, snip, snip on a Sunday, yes. and really if we didn't have those people, and people like Kate Ashbrook of the Open Spaces Society and other sort of people who keep the cause in the public mind all the time, um, these footpaths would be overgrown and lost. One of the greatest pleasures is being able to open an explorer map and stick your finger down and say, I'm going to walk there today, and under your finger will be a footpath, because we've maintained them and sustained them and kept them open, and we've had activists insisting that we do that over all these years. There they are, and they're written down on the map. All other countries envy our maps and our footpaths. Perhaps we, perhaps we don't understand that quite enough um, in this country. Mm. We, we are the envy of the world as far as walking is concerned. A lot of people have a, a misconception that walking is all about climbing a fell or, or a mountain. But there's a lot of great walking to be had from our towns and cities, isn't there? Oh, completely. I mean, I live in Bristol and uh, I went walking yesterday at Castle Coombe. We had a dapple walk, eight, about eight miles, just round through the, through the valleys. It was beautiful. So one of my favourite walking counties is Essex which is a country which most people would pass by without even looking at it, because they think Essex is one thing, you know, they have this popular misconception. It's absolutely beautiful out there, within an hour of central London by public transport. Yes. You can be right out there in the, the muddy creeks with the, you know, the shell duck and the, and the geese and the big skies, nobody around. I think walking is really, it sounds a bit sort of psychogeographical to say so, but it's a state of mind, isn't it? So tell us about your new book. Oh, this was a book that I, I uh, first published eight or nine years ago, perhaps. It's published by New Holland. It's called Walks in the Country Near London, which is not exactly the most inventive title you can imagine. But, <laughs> but, but, it, but it, it's a Ron Seal job. <laughs> ding, ding. Um, and it's 25 walks within, with, within an hour by train of central London. So they're all from railway stations. And they're in Kent, up among the apple orchards and the Blossom on the River Medway. They're in Surrey, along the North Downs Way, in, in, the, in the woods there in Buckinghamshire, Leafy Bucks, and then up on the Chilterns in, in, in Hertfordshire, and again round into Essex and out along the creeks. These are just examples I'm giving. So you've got all, these, all this different variety of landscape. Uh, and I suppose the point of the book was, you think about all those people, potential nine million walkers in London, who are feeling trapped in the city, and the, the fantasy is to go out there and have a eight, nine-mile walk, five-mile walk, ten-mile walk, make it a round walk, make sure you can't get lost, fantastic pub on the way, pop into a Norman church and look at the lovely stained glass windows, hang over a gate and look at a field of orchids or, you know, that kind of a thing. What do you think about when you're stuck at the top of your office building? So that was the idea of it. And it, you know, it's, it sold pretty well when it first came out. So they have decided to reissue it. So I've taken out three walks which were, were valid at the time, but now with all these what I call fat cars on the road and you know, four by fours, and I've taken out three of the walks which I thought were dangerous now. And I've replaced them with walks, which I know are, are perfectly good to do. Christopher, thanks for coming on our podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, that's it for another podcast. I hope you're enjoying them. And if you'd like to let us know your comments and suggestions, please do so by Twitter, Facebook, 
email or by leaving us a voice message on our blog. Until next time, thanks for listening and happy walking.